As global migration surges, human smuggling has become big business. I identify as someone who makes other people's dreams come true. Federal agents, state officials, and immigration advocates all push for more resources. We want to make sure that as a country, we're looking at solutions that allow them to seek asylum in a safe way and not putting them in danger. And challenges remain for migrants in New York City and across the U.S. even once they're in the country. They don't give much information about what can happen to us. They just say, relocate yourself, go. This is PBS News Weekly, and I'm Amna Nawaz. The global human smuggling industry is now a multi-billion dollar business. That comes as thousands of people are crossing into Mexico every day from countries as varied as Russia and Venezuela. Many are headed to the U.S. in search of safety and a new life. We recently traveled to Chiapas, Mexico, and filed this report. As day turns to night, the city of Tapachula transforms. And the streets of this southern Mexican hub fill with families from around the world. Over the last three years, Tapachula, just a few miles from Guatemala, has become a global crossroads on the migrant path north. Lo es con vida. Nelson, originally from Haiti, just arrived here in January with his wife and one-year-old daughter. 98% of Haitians that come through here want to go to the United States. The reason I'm planning to stay here is because I'm thinking about my family, a better future for my children, because in my country, there is no future. He left Haiti in 2012, spent years in Chile, and now hopes to call Mexico home, unlike, he says, most migrants who pass through. This is the easiest route to get to the United States. That's why there are so many migrants here from around the world. Of the 195 recognized nations in the world, Mexican authorities have logged migrants from 120 of them coming across their southern border. And those who pay smugglers are passed from handler to handler along the way, often staying in local hotels like these. It's the U.S. or no? But any attempt to speak with them... But you're from Kazakhstan? Okay. You don't want to speak to us? ...is short-lived. So this is part of the problem we're running into again and again here, is a lot of people who are from countries that are not Latin American countries, from Russia, from India, uh, a couple of guys I just met from Kazakhstan, they're staying in these hotels here, but they've basically been told by the smugglers who are moving them not to talk to anyone. Smugglers like Mario. That's not his real name, and we agreed to protect his identity for fear of cartel retribution. But this former bank executive has worked in the human trafficking networks since 2020. Most people will look at what you do and say that you are a smuggler, you are a trafficker. How do you describe what you do? At the beginning, yes, I felt like a criminal. But as people have gotten to know me and now with my clients, I identify as someone who makes other people's dreams come true. Dreams come true? What kind of dreams? I consider myself a facilitator of opportunities. He says he charges anywhere from $7,500 to $21,000 per person. The tougher and longer the journey, from China or India, for example, the higher the cost. Local Mexican officials and cartels take their cuts along the way. He claims he has a nearly 100% success rate getting people into the United States. NewsHour has no way to verify that claim. Without exaggerating, in the time that I've been working with this group, we've moved 50,000 people. In the last two and a half years, you think you've moved 50,000 people, your entire network you work with? Yes, and I think it's probably more. This river crossing is one of the paths Mario uses to move people into Mexico. In this stretch of the Suchiate River, people and goods regularly move back and forth between Guatemala and Mexico. But what we can't show you out of security concerns is an area just beyond the bridge behind me and another area about 100 yards ahead. Those are completely in control of the human trafficking networks. They're smuggling people from as far away as Congo, India and China. But not everyone makes it. Mario concedes this is a business and admits he has held migrants hostage until they paid what they agreed to. But he claims he's never physically harmed anyone. But you know that many more people have been assaulted and have been treated badly and many more don't make it. And you're participating in a system that keeps making sure that people continue on these pathways. And I have thought about it. 
But it's out of my hands, and I can't help them. If they want to travel in a safe and secure way, they should have money. There are legal ways for people to enter the United States, and you're essentially helping them to get around the laws. Why, why do it that way? Why not help people to legally enter the United States? If we help people enter legally, then it's not a business. America Perez is with Jesuit Refugee Services. They're coming from multiple countries, Central America, from Haiti, from Cuba, from China, from Afghanistan, from Congo, from limitless number of places. Her organization helps with everything from travel documents to housing to health support. She says city services are overwhelmed and local patience is running thin. There's no more space for new migrants. They're sleeping on the streets next to the shelters or next to the stores. Because we've had an increase in arrivals, you can see that people who live in Tapachula are unhappy. There have been moments of xenophobia, dissatisfaction. There have been instances where they won't hire people who come from other countries. 20-year-old Mariela has been looking for work for seven months. She fled an abusive partner in Honduras with her one-year-old daughter, Mia Belin. I asked what worries her most. That he will take my daughter away. She receives 5,000 pesos, or about $300, in federal support a month, but that doesn't cover food and diapers and housing. So she wants to head north, to the U.S., or wherever, she says, she can find a job. I've heard the journey is dangerous, but as a mother, I'm willing to risk it all for my child. Of the many people arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border each year, tens of thousands are unaccompanied children. During a recent reporting trip to Arizona, our team met three sisters just after they'd crossed the U.S. border, making the trek alone. Here is part of their story. Genesis is 14, Nicole is 13, and little Valeria is just eight. Now, these sisters had just made the 1,500-mile journey from Chiapas in southern Mexico, where they called home, up to the U.S. border. Their mother had actually left years ago. She'd come to the States as the sole provider to support her family. The girls had been living with a great-grandmother who could no longer care for them, so they headed north to reunite with their mother. Here, in fact, is what Nicole told us about that trip. How did you know where to go or who to go with? We got to know a group and we started trusting each other and helping each other. Why did you leave Chiapas in the first place? Because it's too dangerous. There's a lot of drug trafficking and other stuff. Jeff, as remarkable as it is to see three young girls who have made that very long, very dangerous journey on their own, these sisters are part of a growing trend, officials tell us, they are seeing at the U.S. southern border. More unaccompanied minors arriving there. In 2022, a record high of over 150,000. And like other people arriving at the border, they are coming from more and more countries. So we've seen some uh, officials tell us they've seen unaccompanied children arriving from as far away as Egypt, India, and China. So what happened? now um, to those three young girls and to other unaccompanied minors who are making similar treks? Well, for these three girls, there is now a multi-agency effort that's been triggered. They'll be passed into HHS custody, which has a system to care and house unaccompanied migrant children. They will vet their mother, hopefully reunite them in the coming weeks. We'll continue to follow their story. But the larger question you ask here is exactly right, Jeff. It's how is the U.S. going to continue to provide and care for what we know are a rising number of unaccompanied children who are now coming from further and further afield? It's just one of the many challenges at the border that U.S. authorities now have to deal with. Immigration is a key issue heading into the November general election. Last month, both President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump visited the border on the same day. The News Hour's Laura Barone Lopez filed this report on those dueling visits from Brownsville, Texas. In his second visit to the Texas-Mexico border, President Biden met with Border Patrol and immigration officials in Brownsville attempting to turn the tables on his likely 2024 rival, former President Donald Trump. Here's what I would say to Mr. Trump. Instead of telling members of Congress to block this legislation, join me or I'll join you in telling the Congress to pass this bipartisan border security bill. We can do it together. You know and I know it's the toughest, most efficient, most effective border security bill this country has ever seen. Meanwhile, some 300 miles west along the Rio Grande in the town of Eagle Pass, 
Trump attacked Biden and again demonized migrants. Now the United States is being overrun by the Biden migrant crime. It's a new form of uh, vicious violation to our country. It's migrant crime. We call it Biden migrant crime. The showdown here at the U.S.-Mexico border is set to be a defining battle of 2024, a fight guaranteed when Republicans killed a bipartisan deal designed to stem the flow of migrants and funnel billions to border security. What do you hope President Biden's trip accomplishes? You know, hopefully he takes some good out of this trip, and hopefully when he meets with the Border Patrol agents, they give him an idea of what you can work from. Um, anytime you want something done on the front line, you need to talk to the front line workers. Chris Cabrera is the vice president of the National Border Patrol Council, a union representing 18,000 agents nationwide. The union supported the bipartisan deal. Do you want it to still pass? You know, that's the hope. Um, but at, at the, on top of things, you know, at the end of the day, anything will help. Um, I know there's, a, there's the power of the pen. There's, there's executive action that he's done in the past with, with other issues. Um, he has the power to, to put a stop to this today if he wanted to. Um, Granted, you know, Congress does have some fault in this. They've been uh, kicking the can down the road for, for quite, quite a few years, not, not one side or the other, but, but both sides. And if, if they're not going to do it, then either we get somebody in there that will or, or the president needs to take action like the last president did. With the Senate deal all but dead, sources have told NewsHour that President Biden is considering using his executive authority through a decades-old law to block some asylum seekers from entering the U.S. While state and federal authorities clash in Eagle Pass, becoming a national flashpoint, here in Brownsville, advocates say things are different. We often hear that the border is chaotic, but it's orderly. It's not chaos. Astrid Dominguez is the executive director of Good Neighbor Settlement House, which is one of the groups that helps welcome asylum seekers in Brownsville. What would the impact be for migrants if the U.S. were to put in place more severe asylum restrictions? Seeking asylum, it's a right and we want to make sure that as a country we're looking at solutions that allow them to seek asylum in a safe way and not putting them in danger. Despite the danger, some are still making the long journey with their children. Roxana just arrived from Cuba. It was difficult because we had to travel with coyotes and we had a small child. I cried a lot. It was terrifying. I'm 22 years old. I don't know how I did it, how I was able to flee with my son. It's something that I just don't know how I did it. But I accomplished it, and we're here, and that's the most important thing. Fleeing Venezuela through the Darien Gap, 22-year-old Luria was robbed twice before arriving for her appointment with Customs and Border Protection. I want a better life. I want a better future for my son, and I just want to start a new life. Many of those crossing into the U.S. say they're hoping for a better life. But along the campaign trail, former President Donald Trump is painting immigrants in a much different light. As Jeff Bennett reported, the former president came under fire this week for dehumanizing anti-immigrant remarks at an Ohio campaign event. If I had prisons that were teeming with MS-13 and all sorts of people that they've got to take care of for the next 50 years, right? Young people, they're in jail for Years, if you call them people, I don't know if you call them people. In some cases, they're not people, in my opinion. And in a Fox News interview Sunday, he doubled down on past comments about migrants that echo dictators. Why do you use words like vermin and poisoning of the blood? The press, as you know, immediately reacts to that by saying, well, that's the kind of language that Hitler and Mussolini used. Well, that's what they say. I didn't know that, but that's what they say. Uh, because our, our country is being poisoned. Dartmouth College political science professor Brendan Nyhan has closely followed Mr. Trump's commentary about immigrants over the last decade. He says Donald Trump's rhetoric should be viewed through an historical lens. Donald Trump's descriptions of people from other countries and other racial and ethnic groups as subhuman animals is the kind of language we see in countries before they have ethnic violence or even genocides. It's the kind of language we see when authoritarian movements rise to power. He's appealing to the worst aspects of humanity. It's straight out of the textbooks. And we should be very worried with how mundane it now seems. Following our reporting from Mexico and the U.S. border, I spoke with Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas.
Mr. Secretary, welcome back to the News Hour. Thank you for having me, Amna. I want to begin with what we found in our reporting over these last few days in southern Mexico and the U.S. Mexico border. If you take a look at this map, this is one of the things that struck us. We spoke to dozens of people along the way who were planning on making their way to the United States. This is a list of their countries of origin that were all represented both down in southern Mexico and up at the U.S.-Mexico border. Some countries people might expect, El Salvador, Guatemala, and so on, but also people from Senegal, Mauritania, China, Bangladesh. And we know as those folks make their way to the U.S. southern border, those encounter numbers have been rising. If you look at the trend over the last three years, we were seeing record highs. In fiscal year 21, 1.73 million, up to 2.37 million in 22, and finally 2.47 million in 23. Now we know the administration has been weighing executive action under some kind of presidential authority that could bring those numbers down by restricting asylum access if people enter illegally. Will the president take that executive action? Um, no, a couple points, very importantly, that what we are experiencing at the southern border is reflective of what the world is experiencing. The largest number of displaced people around the world since World War II, if not before then. And so we mention the different nationalities of the individuals arriving at our border. That is what other countries across the Atlantic are experiencing and around the world, number one. Number two, the answer is exactly what the bipartisan group of senators mm -hmm. um, presented to Congress, and that is legislation that provides for much needed fixes to what everyone agrees is a broken system and much needed resources to implement those fixes. Legislation is what is needed. That is what is enduring. Executive actions in the past have been challenged in the court, and executive actions without the accompanying resources will not meet the moment. But absent congressional action, because we know that that bill did not have a path forward in the Republican-led House, absent congressional action, does the president have authority? There is a section of the Immigration and Nationality Act that says he can suspend entry if he finds that entry of migrants is, quote unquote, detrimental to the United States. Should he use that authority to bring down those numbers that you know are taxing resources in our system? We have not given up on Congress in terms of its ability to actually fulfill its responsibility to the American people. We are always considering what we as an administration can do in the shadow of of Congress's failure to act, but we continue to believe that Congress must and can act. We must have them deliver the solution rather than live with the problem. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, Mr. Secretary, thank you. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Anna. Hours after a Supreme Court ruling temporarily allowed a controversial Texas immigration law to go into effect this week, a federal appeals court put it back on hold. That law, known as SB4, would give state officials the power to arrest migrants who they believe entered the U.S. illegally. Gage DeVia of Texas Public Radio joined me to discuss that legal back and forth. Texas argued that this law should be enforced while litigation against it is pending. Uh, but by the end of the hearing and some questioning by the judges, the state asked if at the very least that state officers could arrest migrants to give them federal immigration, uh, give them over to federal immigration authorities. Uh, but the judges said that this was already something that they do with uh, current trespassing laws um, because migrants have already been arrested for that under Operation Lone Star. But just to clarify, that law is not a uh, law, even though it was for a few hours yesterday evening. Gage, as you know, this has really fueled a high stakes state and federal standoff between Governor Abbott and the Biden administration. What are the implications for this beyond Texas and beyond immigration? I think this should be seen as an attempt to codify Operation Lone Star, but without any real infrastructure to see it through. And as advocates and some Democratic members of Congress have pointed out, that these are ultimately policy issues and not policing issues. Uh, but what is happening here, much like with abortion rights through the last few years, is the state attempting to codify culture war issues as policy that don't address the needs of people in border communities, or the state at large. In fact, it kind of outright harms them. So the implication there is that 
there are efforts at addressing these issues and others via policy that are routinely blocked by a nationalist wing of the GOP. And we will likely see that continue without some sort of federal or congressional intervention. So you mentioned SB4 is not law now. What do we expect to happen next? Well, it's going to be a waiting game for these next few weeks in the courts until it is heard on again. But at least at the very least, um, Texas police cannot uh, arrest migrants for um, seeking asylum, which they are legally um, uh, allowed to do so. So as of now, uh, nothing can move on that law, but we'll, it'll just be a waiting game until early April. Gage DeVia of Texas Public Radio joining us tonight. Gage, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Even when migrants make it into the United States, their challenges aren't over. Tim McPhillips from NewsHour's digital video team looked at the realities that migrants face in New York City. In the last two years, more than 175,000 migrants have traveled hundreds of miles from the U.S. southern border to here, New York City. But once they arrive, migrants still face a precarious existence. And the city government, which is obligated to provide them shelter, is facing serious challenges. These challenges are forcing New York City government, leading a metropolis which has been defined by immigration for centuries, to rethink how it handles new arrivals to America. Karen Yee is a reporter for The Gothamist and New York City's public radio station, WNYC. It's a pretty big monster of an operation to care for what is now about 65,000 migrants in the city's care. When migrants arrive in New York City seeking assistance, they first go to the former Roosevelt Hotel, now a migrant processing center. They're coming from from Latin American countries, they're coming from West Africa. They're arriving with no paperwork, often flip-flops, no socks. After a health screening for infectious diseases like tuberculosis or chickenpox, migrants then enter a complex web of city services. If they want to go to another state or city, New York City will actually pay for their travel. If not... The city then is obligated to place new arrivals across a sprawling network of 200 plus shelters that the city has, has sort of propped up. That obligation comes from something that is unique to New York, the right to shelter decree. It stems from a 1979 lawsuit arguing the city was not doing enough to provide shelter to the unhoused. To settle the case, the city entered a court mandated consent decree, committing to sheltering every unhoused man and later women and families in the city. But now, the city's shelters are overburdened and overwhelmed. Over the last two years, our city has been managing an ongoing humanitarian crisis. We have been clear since day one that the right to shelter was never intended to apply to large-scale migrant populations arriving without housing or legal work status. Liza Schwartzwald is the Director of Economic Justice and Family Empowerment at the New York Immigration Coalition. The mayor has kind of pushed back on this right and said at any given moment, if you're a new arrival, um, then you don't get to have that benefit in the same way. In 2023, the city instituted limits on how long migrants could stay in city shelters. 30 days for single adults, 60 days for young adults and families. After that, migrants must either take a ticket to leave New York City for anywhere else, an option that very few migrants take, or reapply for shelter. But due to a settlement reached last week, migrant adults must now prove they are trying to seek housing elsewhere in order to reapply and remain housed within the shelter system. And now they have the power to deny. And that is is a historic and that is a change. And there's a list of 13 things, and the settlement is pretty specific here, that can include anything from applying for asylum, right? Uh, taking an English language course, uh, getting a work permit, um, anything like that. But that's not necessarily an easy task when you may or may not have any official documentation, may not speak English, and could be placed in a shelter hours away from where you had been previously living. So says Power Malu, executive director of Artists, Athletes, Activists, a community organization connecting migrants with services and support. So what you're having is Organizations like ours have helped them to apply for certain things and they are waiting for their mail and they are moved after 30, 60 days and then they go back to the place where they were staying and they're told your mail is not here and we can't help you. But the migrant crisis in New York is not happening in a vacuum. But the truth is the migrant crisis is sort of like the frosting on top of an existing affordability crisis that is here in New York and in other cities. We want people to have a safe place to sleep at night, but then they're not given access to childcare, so they can't leave their children. Um, they're not having their work authorization, so they can't go out and get a job. 
Um, and all of these pieces are making it very, very difficult for them to find stability. While some migrants claiming asylum can work right away, depending on where they are coming from, many can't. Those asylum seekers are subject to a 150-day waiting period before applying for working papers. What that's meant is that many of the families who, quite frankly, would come and immediately begin to work and to try to build lives for themselves, they're being stymied. That forces many migrants into an informal labor economy to try to make ends meet, finding jobs such as food delivery drivers or day laborers. And for migrants who have crossed oceans and continents in hopes of finding safety in New York City, it doesn't feel like that, says Malu. A lot of the migrants are dealing with a lot of depression because of the treatment that the city is giving them. We're seeing a lot of people kind of at the very bottom of their journey. They feel like there is no one that is going to want to help them anymore because the place that they thought they were going to get the help they're not getting it. On March 14th, New York City was allowed to apply for $106 million in federal reimbursement funds for housing migrants, aid money that was allocated last year, but that has been held up in Washington. The city government says that they have spent $4 billion on the issue so far, and that the crisis could cost upwards of $12 billion over the next three years without policy changes. And with legislation aimed at helping the migration crisis on the federal level being blocked in Congress, New York City is left grappling with this slice of a global humanitarian crisis largely on its own, both politically and financially. New York has always been a beacon of hope for the immigrant, right? We have the Statue of Liberty welcoming immigrants, asking for your poor, your, you know, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Like that is the, the reputation that we have built and that we try to live here. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Tim McPhillips. And that is PBS News Weekly. I'm Amna Nawaz. From all of us here, thanks so much for watching.